Virginia Woolf is considered one of the most important modernist 20th century authors. She was a pioneer in the use of stream of consciousness as a narrative device. Her life and works are widely known to the English speakers, but there is one important fact about her that is often ignored. And that fact is that she had a superhuman writing routine. November 1905, Virginia Woolf wrote in her diary, The Times Literary Supplement sends me one novel every week, which has to be read on Sunday, written on Monday, and printed on Friday. For 30 years, Virginia Woolf used to receive a book on Friday, read it by Sunday, write 1,500 word review about it by Wednesday so it could be edited and published by Friday. She repeated the same pattern for 30 years, almost every week. I assume that you, same as I am, are interested how could she possibly be so efficient for such a long time, for three decades? In this video, I would like to share with you what could have possibly helped Virginia Woolf to be so efficient and productive over three decades of her life. I think at some point of your YouTube career, you realize that nobody is watching you, so you get more confident speaking on public. When I found out about this super efficiency, superhuman efficiency and productivity of Virginia Woolf, I was, of course, stunned. I couldn't imagine me doing something like this. It's difficult for me to record a YouTube video a week with all the scripting and editing, and she was essentially reading a book, writing about it, writing well about it, and then sending it to her publisher. I think like I was stunned by her dedication, by her passion, by her um, pleasure in reading. That's why she was capable of doing all of this. What calmed me down, however, is the fact that today there is not a single writer at the Times Literary Supplement who repeats the same routine as Virginia Woolf did in, back in 1905. My serenity, however, was temporary because I couldn't stop thinking about this. I really needed to find out how she could possibly do this every week for 30 years. The answer to this question lied not in Wolf's productivity system, and not even in her daily routine, but in what motivated her to write. Wolf started writing her reviews in February 1905. After meeting Bruce Richmond, the editor of the Times Literary Supplement, at a party two months earlier. Under his tutelage, the weekly circulation of the eight-page appendage to the Times reached 20,000 copies, and it became acknowledged, in the words of T.S. Eliot himself, as the most respected and most respectable literary periodical of its day. In our age of hyperconnectivity, when each of us can launch a newsletter, a podcast, or a YouTube channel to get our voices heard, we tend to forget that 100 years ago this was impossible. For Virginia Woolf to write for the TLS was a huge privilege. It meant that she could get the voice of her sharp intelligence and deep passion for books to be heard by 20,000 weekly readers. It also meant to get paid for what she loved to do. I was transformed from a girl in a bedroom with a pen in her hand into a professional woman, Wolf wrote in her journal. In her reviews, she attempted to get a fuller understanding of the novel as form. She imagined her audience as busy people catching trains in the morning or tired people coming home in the evening. Her role, as she saw it, was to share her own enthusiasms with her audience, to acknowledge and celebrate the influence of her own cranks, tastes and interests as she guided them to enter into the mind of the writer, to see each work of art by self, and to judge how far each artist has succeeded in his aim. A real work of art, in Wolf's opinion, comes alive 
on encounter with the reader and it changes with him. A book isn't written a masterpiece, it becomes one. A great book can be defined as a book at each fresh reading of which we notice something different in us. In my personal experience, I reread Dante's Divine Comedy every year and I notice a new message that I haven't noticed or encountered before. The Divine Comedy changes as I change throughout life. And that is the definition of being a great book. It can accompany you throughout your life and change along with you. Years later, in her journal, Wolf wrote that her reviewing is act of testifying before I die to the great fun and pleasure my habit of reading has given me. When Bruce Richmond retired in May 1938, Virginia Woolf mourned the end of her 30-year connection with him in her diaries. I learned a lot of my craft of writing from him, how to compress, how to enliven, and also was made to read with a pen and notebook seriously. Today we treat geniuses as if they are machines with cogs moving in them and that's why we use words such as productivity or routines when we try to explain how they were so efficient, how they were so productive. When we try to explain how could Picasso make like 50,000 paintings throughout his life or how Auguste Rodin could have made thousands of sculptures, we try to explain it as if they are machines, as if we are examining a car or a plane. The reality is that the reason why they were so prolific, why they were so efficient, is because of their incessant passion for what they did. The secret to Wolf's ability to read, write, edit and publish an article a week lied not in her daily routine, but in her passion for reading and her desire to get heard. Two priceless pleasures she couldn't live without.